Hello, everyone, and welcome to another debrief episode of Channel 781 News. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing the exchange that happened with George Darcy's resolution on bike and pedestrian safety. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the ward meetings, uh, the master plan ward meetings, uh, and the most recent one in Ward 3. And uh, we have yet another update on where we're at with marijuana licenses in the city. Um, but we are joined with the usual Josh Castor. Hello. James P. Kellys. Hello, everyone. And Emily Superior. Why, hello. Um, so this past city council meeting uh, was uh, taken up largely on um, confirmations of appointments from the mayor. Uh, I didn't find them too interesting, so we're not really going to talk about them, um, but some of them are important and they might uh, be relevant later. Um, pretty much encompass the entire meetings I'm going to say that again. Uh, the topic that uh, caught most people's attention was George's resolution to look at bike and pedestrian safety. It should be noted, too, that he did have one more planned, which was the uh, resolution to look at uh, separated bike lanes on Lexington. That was sent to Public Works and Public Safety, which inexplicably was not on the docket and did not meet this week. So something is afoot there. I don't know what it is, um, but if, if if a resolution is sent to a committee, the committee meets and they talk about it. And that's just what happens. So it's very strange that they did not meet. Something is afoot there. Not exactly sure what it is. But Committee of the Whole saw the pedestrian and bicycle ad hoc committee being talked about. And it went about as well as I thought it was going to do uh, go, which was very poorly. Um, and uh, it met some criticism from Paul Cates and Kathy Ann Harris. And ultimately, it was sent to the master plan committee, um, the entire resolution. But I'm unsure if the resolution itself is sitting in there and it's going to be discussed just like any other committee, like just this one was discussed, or if the committee has absorbed the resolution, it's intense and it's concerned if it's been absorbed. So I'm not exactly sure where it is, but I'm gonna address some of those points um, that were talked about. Um, so George introduces the resolution again and talks about you know why it's important and why uh, pedestrian bike safety is important and why creating a committee to look at is important because Waltham has never really addressed this um, through its entire history. Um, and then, First up is uh, Paul Cates, uh, the Ward 7 City Councilor, coming off fresh from his uh, success with the mailbox resolution, which Waltham Channel uh, did an article about after we did an article about it. Um, so I know that Paul was supportive of this because he sent an email uh, to some of these supporters of it saying, oh, I, uh, I love uh, bicycle and pedestrian safety. I agree that this is a major concern. And so it seemed supportive in the committee though not supportive and uh, you know he he did a very politician thing of saying you know i i agree that bike and pedestrian safety is important uh you know these are my concerns as well but and you know everything after that is just him just acknowledging that he was never supportive of this um and so i'm going to use some quotes here um an at from him uh an ad hoc committee could make in the long term and in the short term, the role of the ward counselors advocating the needs of our community more difficult. Um, this confused me immediately uh, because does he hold the same concerns for the Conservation Commission, the Historical Commission, the Zoning Board of Appeals? Does he want to abolish these committees because they make the role of city councilor more difficult because it adds a layer? Or does he not view the concerns of bike and pedestrian safety as legitimate as he said, he does immediately before that statement. Uh, and this is in the wild fantasy world where a bike and pedestrian ad hoc committee would have actual teeth where, you know, the things they say are, are binding, which would never happen in Waltham, although it should. Luckily for Paul, just in the beginning of this committee, there was an example of how a committee like that would operate. Phil Moser of the Conservation Commission was in Committee of the Whole uh, earlier uh, demonstrating how his commission works uh, and its group's power, which is that the Conservation Commission for most intensive purposes recommends uh, to the city council when it when it when it is asked to. And that's essentially what the what this bike and safety pedestrian commission would look like, probably if there would ever be a special permit. Mostly it would be reporting and advocating um, 
And so that concern was very strange to me. Uh, quote from Paul, uh, this could be a citizen advocacy group and doesn't need to be a formal committee. Um, luckily, this concern is brought up by George already, where he makes a motion to hear from another city's bicycle and pedestrian committee. Uh, to They invite uh, one of them to come to this committee, um, Committee of the Whole, which is now Mastermind Committee, um, to talk about how their committee runs and why it's useful and stuff. Uh, and again, this is a committee most cities have this committee. Most cities see the need for this committee. It's not a weird, radical idea to have this committee. Um, so hopefully Paul's concerns will be addressed. He talked a lot about how he agrees with a lot of what George is saying about how unsafe the roads are and the need for this, but he doesn't see a need for a formal committee. A citizen advocacy group would not have the city government working with the committee in Waltham with residents in Waltham and just like many other cities do and uh, we believe that it would yield better results than just a citizen advocacy group um, and hopefully Paul will see that when he hears from the other cities committees um, committee members all okay, right moving on to Kathy Ann Harris who was the other vocal opponent um, Colleen Bradley MacArthur was a vocal supporter and that was the extent of the conversation everybody else has opinions but they are fine with either letting Kathy Ann uh, kill it or let Colleen try to support it. Um, Kathy Ann Harris was way, way more assertive in her disapproval uh, of this. And so I'm gonna bring up some quotes and then I'm just gonna talk for like five minutes. Um, she opens immediately with, if you want to make good decisions and plan, you don't add extra layers to the decision making process. You go to the top, and make those concerns visible and you work with the city government and all of their committees. She talks about how she's really interested in results and she's tired of dialogue, the committee being the dialogue, um, that there's already a master plan committee with meetings and you can give your input there uh, for dialogue, how she listens to all of the comments at these master plan committee meetings and she's excited to work with them and, and all of this and how she cares about these issues, how she even uh, quote, brought a bike rack resolution in her first year on uh, city council on Moody Street. It didn't pass. So she spouts this huge faith in the government, which is essentially what she's saying is that she, you should just trust the government and the city master plan committee uh, to do this. There's a need to be more oversight. There's a need to be more accountability. And she wants you to trust that a non-binding master plan, which we've talked about in the past, this is master plan is non-binding, is going to solve this hugely complex issue. The same government that couldn't even pass a bike rack resolution, the same one, she admits that the, the, the city government that she's talking about, the one that she wants to trust us to trust in without any more oversight, without any more accountability, couldn't even pass a bike rack resolution. And we're talking about reimagining how we look at roads. Um, twice, twice, I can remember Christine Mackin introducing a bike rack resolution in 2017, the very first resolution she ever made, which I use like to use as an anecdote, uh, to add it it's, to add a bike rack resolution at City Hall. Is there a bike rack at City Hall? No, that failed too. And this is the government that we want. We should think nothing should change. Nothing should change, and it's it, it's the government that is also going to do the thing that we're hoping for. That's it's it's silly. I think that's ridiculous. Um, she talked a lot about how. Through the last master plan, uh, which was uh, 2007, uh, they accomplished many things. She leaves out that there's a bunch of things that they didn't accomplish. And we're just supposed to hope that the things that are accomplished are the things that we want. Again, this is a non-binding master plan. Uh, and this also, this is a master plan committee that has existed for a, more than 11 months. They did nothing for those 11 months. And they didn't meet one single time. And, uh, and now that it's the end of the year and the election season is coming up, the, the election year is upon us. Now all of a sudden they're doing this thing, a thing now, which is just listening. It took them 11 months to figure out that they should be listening. Um, and, and these master plans largely unrecorded, um, except when we do it, um, they've recorded one. Um, the WCAC recorded one. Um, 
master plan committees that are largely unannounced and unadvertised, except for some social media posts, uh, master plan uh, committees that um, are not backed by a professional consulting firm like other cities do to actually like put together this and you know address it and let it and have some accountability towards addressing these concerns. Um, I don't buy it. Um, and a quote from Kathy Ann Harris uh, at this meeting, there's a resolution looking at creating separated bike lanes on Lexington Street. Do you know how many emails I got saying, how do I get from the South side to Lexington Street safely to use this bike, bike path? That's why we need a master plan. So does she want more, more bureaucracy or less bureaucracy? Or is she interested in dialogue or results? I can't think of anything more dialogue-y than hours and hours of master plan meetings to come up with a non-binding piece of paper uh, that nobody has to follow. Inter is she interested in results or interested in dialogue? Because George put forward a resolution to achieve results, immediate results, uh, instead of simply talking about bike and pedestrian safety to accomplish it, uh, he just put a res resolution to create the bike path on Lexington, which is all results and no dialogue. Kathy and Harris wanted more dialogue before doing that. And George put forward a resolution looking to create a committee on bike and pedestrian safety to have to have that dialogue, to have folks talk about it. And Kathy Ann wanted less dialogue. She didn't like that much dialogue. So which is it? Is it more dialogue, less dialogue, more bureaucracy or less bureaucracy? Or, or do we just not in favor of this? Is this just not what we are in favor of? Um, is Or is it that, that the oversight includes non-elected officials in this committee. Is that, is that, I think that's the issue. Um, so that was a lot. Um, so Kathy Ann did successfully move this resolution to the master plan committee. I'm, I'm confused if, if, if it's even existing, if, it even, if, it, if it's even in existence anymore. Um, I hope that people continue to email their counselors and continue to come to these master plan committees and talk about this um, because even if it is dead, then, you know, Apparently, all we need to do is put it in, uh, make an email and it'll happen. Uh, we just have to trust that it will happen. I just think that there was sort of a theme um, about do we want to get things done or have the appearance of getting things done that sort of ran through the night? And I think that's a really great point that you brought up, Chris, um, because it, it ran all the way from that discussion through to rules and ordinances where Councilor McLaughlin was actually bringing up, um, it was, uh, I think a zoning ordinance on behalf of Councilor LeBlanc that was around chickens and Councilor Harris spoke up and said, um, you know, as she, you know, is perfectly within reason to something along the lines of, you know, I think that given that the chair of ordinances and rules um, was doing some work on, um, or I guess some zoning around bees and chickens and homesteading type of zoning, that um, it was not the right time to bring forth, you know, any new zoning specifically about chickens. So um, basically, Councilor McLaughlin was asked to uh, withdraw the, um, I guess, the zoning um, that he was bringing forth on behalf of Councillor LeBlanc, which, which he did ultimately. So it was sort of the same idea of saying, well, you know, let's not do this because, um, you know, the idea was that it was redundant work was I think sort of uh, the idea. Um, whether I agree, I, I don't know, because again, it brings up the question of if we have the opportunity to do something in front of us, should we not do that um, just because there's the promise of some other larger plan? It, the way this played out too, with Paul talking about it as raising the issue that it, it would prevent, I guess, the ward counselors from 
properly, like being able to throw a wrench in the works if some constituent doesn't like something. I feel like just from observing how this plays out in practice is that if the counselor in question is on the same page as the rest of the counselors on council, that very quickly turns into them selectively choosing to do things that the council does or doesn't want to do with the veneer of it reflecting constituent input. But if it's in, unless it's like overwhelmingly opposed constituent input that they can't ignore. And in a case like this, you can just shuffle it, shuffle stuff around, say that you're going to listen to citizen input later or that it'll be discussed later and then mm. time passes, doesn't really happen. And that's kind of the way they tend to respond to local constituent, like con their own constituents, if they don't agree with them, emailing them, you're just not gonna get a response. Yeah, I mean, they talked about that, that you, you know, you can email folks and it's the same talking point that they use when they, when people bring up um, the need for public input at the beginning of city council meetings, which many, 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 many cities do. Waltham does not, the only time for citizen input is through public hearings, special permit public hearings, or as I call a couple other special things like citizen input hearings, stuff like that. There's actually very, very little opportunity for citizen input in the public forum. Um, and so when people were like, why don't you just put 15 minutes at the front of every meeting, um, like many, 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 many other cities do, uh, they're like, oh, well, you know, we don't really need that because you can just email city councilors and we'll get back to you. It's just like, councilors choose who to get back to. Is they don't, they're not, there's no accountability for uh, constituent feedback. There's absolutely none. So it, that hasn't been talked about in many, many years, but um, it's the same talking point. It's the same idea of, you know, you, we don't need this committee because you can just email us. Like, I almost wonder if you could FOIA a counselor's constituent emails to see- Oh, of course, yeah, no, I've thought about it. Yeah, spoiler alert. Um, definitely gonna be making a few requests on uh, the master plan. Um, bike and safety, because apparently they have all these opinions. I'm curious about what people said, and uh, you can look into that. I think that the, one other thing worth re-highlighting was just like the, the the faith in government being professed by Harris that like things would happen when at the same time, this is like the same. It's been how many years since um, pot shops were approved? For recreation and no, still nothing. Yeah, this is a government that is very clearly capable of getting absolutely nothing done if they don't want to. Yeah, if they and, don't want it. Yeah. Like, yeah. So basically, um, so the attorney um, provided the site distances and the estimated speeds that were used in the traffic study. And Garvin commented, "Well, traffic engineering recently collected data on that section of the street, Bay Hill Road, and found that the 86th percentile speed is 35 miles per hour." Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So all this stuff, and he he said what you know just what you said, which is in essence, what does that mean? And you know, Garvin said it means the state of the measured site distance does not meet what they claim as mass dot standards for the given speed. So you know, again, Darcy was like, what does that mean? And that's a mandatory requirement, or is that just the discretion of the council? And Garvin saying, according to the letter of what was written, yes, you have to meet the minimum site distances. So mitigation may be required because site distances. And Darcy said, okay, and would the attorney for the applicant like to respond? And the attorney said, yeah, this is a building that's been here. It's existing. I, I don't know what else can be done. This has never been a problem before there. I don't know why it would be now. And Darcy said, we'll take that into consideration. Thank you. And that's sort of how this meeting went. And that's sort of what it was about, um, about telling uh, the dispensaries that they needed to come back with responses in different color pens with in, in line responses to um, city of Waltham attorney notes. Um, and volley back and forth and volley back and forth. Thank you for that summary of uh, ordinance and rules. Is there uh, a next step and a continuing saga of uh, marijuana licenses in Waltham, Emily? Yes, so the next step for all five of these cannabis applicants is there'll be a special meeting on September 24th at 6 p.m. Um, they'll all be there. Stay you said tuned. October, right? 
October 24th, 6 p.m. Okay, uh, we talked a little bit about the uh, master plan uh, committees, um, but touch on it a little further on uh, the Ward 3 uh, meeting just happened uh, yesterday. Uh, I watched the recording, uh, thankfully, uh, by James. Um, I think it was very similar to the other ones, uh, which I thought was interesting. I thought it would be uh, different considering the political leanings of Ward 3, um, but a lot of like in pedestrian safety. Um, I learned that Henna Vava from Watch lives in Ward 3. She talked a lot about affordable housing, which is awesome. Uh, Marie Daly uh, and Sonia Wadman uh, talking about the land trust and uh, open space, which is awesome. Um, and our friend Daniel Sari also great speech, opening speech about um, bike and pedestrian safety and uh, the Fernald. Um, so if you haven't seen that recording, uh, it's on Waltham Data, the only place you'll find any mention of that uh, meeting um, is recording. I mean, th this sort of does reflect the lack of transparency because this isn't, none of these have been getting recorded and the only uh, notes basically are ones that have been scribbled down by counselors, right? Mm -hmm. For the- like, Well, this is, it is a formal meeting. So there has to be notes taken. Mm -hmm. um, who knows what those notes are gonna look like and when they're gonna be released. Mm -hmm. And, and like how those then get translated into the into the into the yeah yeah there's no I, there's no process for that it's just like what do you guys want to do just type something up but just going off of like a lot of the people showing up it's been a lot of people recognizing just how dangerous the roads are and demanding something get done about it and yeah it, we're gonna see if they if that master plan acknowledges that and it's interesting because like, you know, Waltham's positions where like a lot of people are commuting through Waltham to get into Boston and you see spillover basically from route two onto Trapello. And you also see like the same kind of spillover happening from like 90 into main street and people just trying to get into Boston. And if you listen to traffic engineers, that'll turn into trying to make traffic go as fast as possible down those roads and turn them to highways. And mm. I think it's good to see people who actually live around these things showing up to say this is not where we want to live and this is not what we want like i think I, a good number of the people were just pointing out that like there's no sidewalks on trapello the entire length you have to like cross the road to stay on the sidewalk a major artery of the city yeah no sidewalks hasn't been in a long time i used to canvas around there nightmare chris i just want to expand on something you referred to earlier about how the meetings were promoted and like mm -hmm. what was the real intent of the meeting they announced they were doing these public input sessions and the mission of the committee was to reconcile two prior versions of the master plan and we're not sure it wasn't immediately clear where those versions were or where um whether they were available to the public but as we understand um the prior version is from 2007 emily was that your understanding too Yes, what Councillor LeBlanc said at the beginning of the master input meeting, he did refer to a 2007 master plan um, document. So that's interesting. Thank you. That's interesting because in that 2007, so that's uh, 15 years ago. Am I doing the math right? So if you're updating a master plan from 15 years ago, <laughs> like you shouldn't be updating it, right? You should have already done most of the things in that one and now you're planning for the next 15 years, right? But it seems like that sort of implies that just the planning process has not is, is still going on for 15 years. So the other thing that was odd about it is they didn't promote these meetings to the public really. It was announced in a meeting. Um, and then I posted something about it on Instagram. Other people posted about it on Instagram like Waltham Community Farms. And then um, Councillors Paz and Bradley MacArthur made their own video about it. I don't think any of the other councillors did anything to promote it as far as I know. And then um, the city announced it on Facebook after the first meeting had already happened. So it kind of raises this question of, did they really want the public to come? Maybe they were thinking, you know, they wanted it to spread by word of mouth because then only some certain uh, subset of the public would come who they thought was more likely to have the same agenda that they wanted to hear about. Um, and in fact, uh, there was a post on Facebook in Mrs. Venaria's Facebook group. Somebody <laughs> posted about this and they said, uh, you know, I'm hearing that there are 
these meetings are being well attended by people with a particular agenda. And she said the agenda was to basically, since electric cars are the future, people want to get rid of all gas stations and mechanics and parking mm -hmm. lots. And she said, we are not, I am not ready to embrace this futuristic wall fan. And so it was sort of complaining. And the person who posted it wasn't a public figure, but Councillor LaFauci liked on it. Um, a bunch of other people who are sort of connected to the city council liked on it. So it was kind of like, oh, so you didn't really want the public. You just <laughs> wanted people who agree with you to come. And so uh, as Chris mentioned, this raises the question of, well, what, you know, what's really the intent with this master plan? Are these meetings yeah. going to happen? any effect on anything. And I think because we're recording them and because people are taking really detailed notes, it, what we're doing is creating a record of what people in Waltham actually want, what the priorities are as spoken by people who showed up, not as people who stayed home and commented on Facebook. And so I hope if that, if these aren't reflected in the master plan or if the master plan doesn't end up influencing the actual in, um, actions of the city, we have a record of it, and we can try to, in next year's election, find candidates who are more in line with these priorities. What's funny, um, yeah, you're talking about how it, in its conception, the idea of this master plan committee in citizen input hearings was the reconciliation of the two master plans, but no one, not and not the, not the committee members, not every single ward counselor that gets to speak at all these, not one has brought up these these past master plans. Like it's not, it's not, it, for all intents and purposes, that is not the intent of these meetings. It's not to look at those master plans. It's just to create a new one, which is fine. Which is like, what is the point? Like, what, are you taking this seriously? Like, is that, was that your serious intention or is your intention to create a new one? Like where, like, I, there's not enough, the messaging is off. Um, and I also, I thought that Facebook post was hilarious and the fact that she was like, they're coming with an agenda, uh, and I don't like that. So I'm going to go to mine and, uh, with my agenda, it's <laughs> just like, yeah, go ahead. That's what the, that's what they're there for. Well, I liked when it said, I do not embrace this futuristic wolf and because it kind of really encapsulates like what's at stake with local yeah. politics it's like sort of like pro future versus anti future and what is the future also fuck what, cars also also i want to go to a place go back to a place when cars weren't invented so i want to go what, in the past let's go one, past one, one, one other thing i think is also important to bring up in that has been brought up in every one of these meetings is uh housing unaffordability and that's another thing that's like this isn't like a futuristic thing people need to be able to live places and it, it's not it's a real problem if like people's kids aren't going to be able to afford to live in the, like the city where they grew up just like from a from a like population standpoint like people aren't going to be able to like want to have families or anything like that if it's going to be that if it's that expensive they just exist from the 2000, 2007 document they, they they talk about how unaffordable housing is and there's another document on their website for referencing housing affordability and pretty much saying that there's too much like high AMI housing and they need to do more low AMI housing and we've seen an example of that in the armory that just went nowhere and mm. just to tie this back to the theme of if the city council actually wants something to happen it ha it might happen if they don't it mysteriously doesn't yeah I mean they support affordable housing but like just trust support. that they're going to do it we don't don't don't, don't win any accountability we will do it 15 years later no, I don't want to well, say nothing. Well, well, 15 years later, you'll still have people bringing it up as a problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's definitely the city, city of Waltham has done several things to address affordable housing, not anywhere near what needs to happen. And they're probably in a worse position now than 15 years ago. Was... The uh, other thing, too, is with the way that um, these meetings have been getting promoted, part of the reason these meetings have to be promoted or at least posted on the city web website in the same way that any other city council meeting is because for public meeting laws, you have to post when city councilors are going to be in the same place just mm -hmm. in general and mm -hmm. so far these meetings have been extremely well attended by city councilors even from outside their wards like the yeah. last meeting has had better attendance than i've seen in communities <laughs> of the whole so like the um so like the, the ratio of constituent to city councilors is extremely uh uh low yeah 
I, well, I, I mean, the, the outreach for it was almost nothing. The city of Waltham has the funds and capabilities to send a mailer out to every single resident of Waltham. They do it almost every year for other things. They could have been doing that. You know, how seriously are they taking? As far as city councilor attendance, I wonder if um, it's an easy chance for them to show their faces in front of constituents as well as interact. Whereas city council, there you know there might be the um, select and growing number of people who watch from home, but um, you know they know whoever comes to that master input meeting is going to probably remember that their ward counselor um, yeah. was there. So it's a way to scope out the competition uh, because um, this is a good opportunity for people that are running next year to do it, uh, which by the way, spoiler also uh, just a guess, Bill Hanley spoke at the ward three uh, yesterday, the way he was speaking, the cadence he was speaking, the content he was speaking, Bill Hanley is going to run for something next year, whether it be in ward three or at large, uh, quote me on that. We're going to bring this back when it happens. That's to get back on. He's run but once before, right? In more two. He, okay. And uh, he's currently on the board of health. Yeah, he sits on the board he, of health yeah, and okay. involved in a lot of sports. Good friends with Joey Lacava. He will run. Um, okay. We have talked a lot about this and other issues. I thought this was a good episode. And I think it is time to leave. So thank you uh, very much, everyone, uh, for this entertaining chat. And we will see everyone next week. <laughs> Bye, Bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you.